Yo, you guys, this is Blacklist of the Abyss, and this is my review for Strike the Blood, Episode 6. Now, before I get into the review, I just want to let you guys know that it's been officially confirmed that Strike the Blood is going to have 24 episodes. So, that's a great thing. That's a great thing. I've mentioned this a lot, a lot of times before, but this series has a lot of different groups and a lot of potential for future story progression and just elements it just has a lot of story elements in it and it just has the story has a lot of room to grow and it would be kind of hard to just have this anime be 12 episodes or 13 episodes because we'll just barely be able to dive into the world but now that we have 24 episodes we'll be able to get a bigger sense of what's going on which is what you need for a series that has as much going on as this series does but uh, now I'm just going to get into the review, though, because I have a lot to talk about, because there's a lot of stuff that happened during this episode. But uh, it starts off where the last one ended, and that brunette girl, she just starts shooting forks at Kojo, and it's ju just like I predicted last week, all right? It's, she, and, she was Himuragi's roommate. She was her friend. This is not, this was, I called this from a mile away, not going to lie, I, but I did. Um... Turns out her name is Sayaka, and she's a war dancer. So there, not only are there a lot of groups in this series, but there are a lot of different types of characters. And when I say types of characters, I don't mean like personalities, personalities and things. I mean war dancer, sword shaman, terrian throat, vampire, progenitor, uh, attack mage, homunculus. There are just a lot of different types of characters with different types of abilities and it's really diverse and that makes it that makes the series good as well but uh, we learned that war dancers specialize in hexes and assassinations and we also learned that she just does not like Kojo at all she just does not like him she won't even she doesn't she won't even let him say Himuragi's name she she says that she wants him to stop following her around which does not make any sense because Himuragi is the one following him around, but whatever, 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 you know, we, we know how anime girls are, they don't like to get facts, they don't like to have facts get in the way of their argument, so, you know, let her continue to be an anime girl. <laughs> um, after this, we actually go away from that group for a little bit and we see Asagi, and she's talking to Yase on the phone, and she's under the impression that Kojo is dating Himiragi, which isn't true, but she thinks that he is, and he's just trying to hide it. But Yase tells her, nah, that's probably not the case. It, you know, he's he's probably he's hanging around with her, but that's probably because she has some dirt on him or something like that. So you should try you should try and seduce some info out of him. So that that was an interesting way for the that was an interesting way for the conversation to turn in, but um. He ends up ending the conversation saying that he has to call his girlfriend, which is a really weird way to end. He could have just said, I have stuff I have to do, but he said, no, I have to call my girlfriend. So I don't think that his girlfriend is just some random person who we're never going to meet. I think she's, it's, I'm not even sure if he has a girlfriend. That might have just been an excuse. Like, uh, for instance, he was talking to, uh, a couple episodes ago, he was talking to this bird, and there was this girl talking through the bird, I'm assuming, unless the bird was a terianthrope, someone who transformed into a bird. Then there's also that girl who is probably affiliated with them, or the person talking to the bird, who was watching, or not watching, but she, we saw her around the time when Kojo activated Regulus Arm. So it's probably like, when he says girlfriend, he probably just means one of his, one of the people he's working with. But if in the case that it is his real girlfriend, she will probably end up being important too. Because there's just no real reason to just throw in that fact in there. Like, oh, I have a girlfriend. Like I, cause he, like I said before, just a couple seconds ago, he could have just said, oh, I have stuff to do. I have to leave now. I'll call you back. Or something like that. But they went through the effort of pointing out that he has a girlfriend. So that will probably be relevant in the future. But um, after he hangs up, Asagi gets this uh, email or something. And it's, it's this puzzle type of thing that she has to solve. And she takes it as a challenge, which I've seen this before, but uh, I'll I'll get to that later. Um, we go back to Dimitri and 
Kojo and Sayaka and Himiragi, and we learn that Dimitri was actually in love with Aurora. And now that Kojo has consumed Aurora, he's going to di direct his love to Kojo. So that's interesting. But um, Himuragi steps up and they, she starts talking with Dimitri. And he says that he can smell her blood emanating from Kojo's body. So that would make her Regulus Arms medium. Not really sure what that means. I guess through Himiragi, he is allowed to use Regulus Arm or something like that. I'm not really sure. He doesn't. Like, it's. I don't, I'm not really sure how important Himiragi is in summoning Regulus Arm, but whatever. Um, also, the fact that he could smell Himiragi's blood emanating from Kojo. I, I don't know if that he either has a good sense of smell in general. Or just a good sense of smell when it comes to blood, since he's a vampire too. But either way, I think it's just worth pointing out how good his sense of smell is. But um, he also points out that because she is a prospective blood partner of Kojo, she is also his rival in love. And uh, the way that Himuraki actually reacts to this, she doesn't deny it, and Sayaka's not exactly happy about it, but... She doesn't really show any anger on her face either, but Himuragi decides to change the subject away from her love life and who she's in love with, and she ends up talking to Vatler about why he and Sayaka are there, and he says it's about Christoph Gardos, who we saw last episode, I believe, and uh, we already know that he's a terrorist, we already know how involved he is with the Black Death uh, Emperor faction, but now we learn that he's a former soldier as well from Warlord's Dominion. And uh, we also learn about Black Death Emperor Faction and that it's a group that wants to give superiority to Therianthropes. Which is interesting, because if you recall, back in probably my first review for uh, for Strike the Blood, I mentioned that, you know, with all the groups that are in this series, there might also be other groups that are specific that specifically have vampires or Therianthropes or something in them. And the Black Death Emperor Faction is one of those groups. So that, yet again, mean if, you know, if there's a faction of just Therianthropes, there can be a faction of just vampires, mermaids, half-humans, half uh, I forgot, like, fairies, I forgot some of the other ones that they, other supernatural creatures that they had, but, you know, they, there could be other groups of people like that, or other, just like, other factions, things like that, so that's, you know... And they all have different agendas. So again, not only do we have the Lion King organization, uh, the police that Natsuki works for, um, just all these different groups, the churches, Lotharingia, and probably other churches as well. But now we also have just different supernatural beings creating their own groups with their own agendas and doing stuff and becoming terrorists and things like that. So that's... The, the potential growth of this series is just immeasurable. Like, the story can... You can there's so much that can happen in this story. It's unbelievable. That's, it's, that's Like I said before, it's why it's a good thing this is getting 24 episodes. That's going to be two core instead of just one core. But um, back to the Black Death Emperor faction. We learned that their goal is to have the Sacred Treaty revoked so that they can take over... Lost Warlord's Dominion in the area that he rules over. Um, not smart. It's really not. Judging from what we saw from Gardo's last episode, it's just not... You know, they they can't beat a start day. They think they're going to beat Lost Warlord. I mean, even Fatler, he's he's strong. We learned, that, we learned here that his f familiars, they can sink the entire island if they want to. And it wouldn't be very hard. So he's... The reason why he's here, they end up saying that it's because he wants to take Gardos down, and just a whole Black Death Emperor faction down. Which, you know, if he does that, he'll sink the island. So he, that's not good. Kocho is not a fan of this idea, and neither is Himuragi. So she steps up and says, no, no you're not going to do anything. I'm going to take care of Gardos and the whole uh, Black Death Emperor faction. Because she also doesn't want... 
Kojo to get too involved. Just like with the whole uh, Eustache and Astarte case. The more he does, the more the Lion King organization is going to be saying, you know, this guy might be a threat. Same thing with the other three progenitors. So the more he stands out, the more danger he's going to be in in the future. So he, so she just decides she's going to do it on her own. But after this, we go see Asagi, and she ends up cracking the code, and we learn that it involves Nala Kuvera. And this goes back to what I was saying before about how this reminds me of stuff. Uh, if I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Summer Wars. I don't know if this has been used in any other movie or anime or manga, but in Summer Wars, there's also a situation where these people, or not the, these, yeah, these people, they just randomly get an email one night with this code that no one can crack, and they just, and they take it as a challenge, and they crack the code, and then it ends up being this awful thing, like, that they end up using in the series, because it was the security for this uh, certain website, social networking thing that is involved way too much in life, but, in the, in the movie at least, but, you know, this site's responsible for, like, keeping traffic lights in check, you know, without that, the traffic lights go off, trap, people keep crashing and everything, um, I think the fire department, it affected them as well, and the police, and just, it affected way too much stuff, but the point is that I've seen this before, where people get this code and they take it as a challenge, they solve it, and it ends up being a bad thing that they solved it, so I just thought that was interesting that, uh, Sagi just went and solved it, for the heck of it, but, um, after that, she goes back to her bed, she gets this text for, or email, I guess, one of the two, from Yase, t telling her how to be a honey trap, so how to seduce Kojo. And that's when we see Kojo waking up in the morning to a soggy on top of him. And she tells him that if, he's, if he sleeps for too long, she's going to have to do things to him. And then as soon as he hears that, he, he purposely decides to go back to sleep. So that was funny. That, that was funny. But uh, the two of them, they end up... He tries to get her to get off of him. And they end up falling off of the bed with Kojo on top of Asagi. And of course, you know, right right in the nick of time, Nagisa and Himiraki come in. And the worst part about it is that Asagi actually looked like she was unconscious. So it looked like Kojo like forced her onto the ground and knocked her out. But um, those two leave, disappointed of course in Kojo for something he didn't even do. But you know, Sayaka too. Sayaka ended up seeing the whole thing. Not the whole thing, obviously. Or she she would have known it was an accident. But she saw it, and that you know her attitude towards Kojo is even worse now. But Asagi ends up getting up, talking to it, talking to Kojo. And confirming that he is not dating Himuragi. And he, she also learns that, you know, that Himuragi know not necessarily dirt, but Himuragi knows something about Kojo, so she learns that. Then we end up seeing Himuragi and Kojo meeting up at the train station. And in broad daylight, again, in broad daylight, they're, talk they're talking about Kojo being a vampire and how his urges could have uh, taken him over. But uh, Himuraki tells him that he should be more careful so that he doesn't get Asagi involved in the whole mess because he doesn't want Asagi involved. Then as they're walking to school, they're again, yet, yet again, talking in broad daylight about how they're going to go about all this uh, Christoph Gardos business and Black Death Emperor faction stuff. And Himuraki decides she's going to go talk to Natsuki because she knows a lot about this stuff. And they're going up to Natsuki's office, and it turns <laughs> turns out that her office is higher up than the principal's, which is incredibly interesting. It shows you how big Natsuki is when it comes to the school and just her reputation in general. But um, Astarte is also there. Apparently she's, she's on probation, and she's serving it under Natsuki, working with her, being her maid, and helping her out on cases and stuff. But, um, she ends up telling Kojo and Himuraki that catching Gardos isn't necessary, and we know, we know why, because of what happened last episode, but she doesn't really go into details about that. But she does tell them that Nala Kuvera isn't usable, that it's this ancient weapon that was discovered with the stone tablet that explains how to use it. 
but no one can decipher the tablet. So no one knows how to use it. And apparently Nalakubera has already been stolen, but since no one knows how to use it, they don't think it's that big of a deal, though they are still searching for it. Natsuki says that something fitting Nalakuvera's description was found in the in a corner of the subfloat. And I'm going to assume that that's the information that Usagi uh, uncoded the night before. But I'm not really sure because of what happens towards the end of the episode. But I'll get to that when I get to it. Um, she also ends up warning Kojo that uh, Dimitri Vatler has consumed two elder vampires so she warns him that you know he might try and consume you next so you should look out for yourself but after this she ends up leaving to head over to the sub float to investigate whether or not it's Nalaku Vera uh Kojo he's thinking that he needs to be able to defend himself better if he wants to stand a chance against Vatler and he says he needs to get his familiars under control he needs to have better control over his familiars and uh, Himaragi, she kind of just offers her services to him again. She says, you know, if you want to suck my blood, you can, which I guess I was, i that's one thing I was wrong about. I thought that, from the preview, I thought Kojo was actually going to suck her blood this episode, but it turns out it was just Himaragi offering it. But it's not that big of a deal, because a lot of better things end up happening later in this episode. As a matter of fact, right after this, um, Kojo ends up going to Asagi and asking her to look into Nalaku Vera, and she remembered the name from the night before, so she decides to agree. And uh, Yaze, she see Yaze, he sees the two of them walking off right before class starts, and he thinks, you know, this is interesting. So he puts on his headphones with this, with this cool look on his face, and apparently he can use some sort of like sonar echolocation type of thing, and he can... Find out the he can see the layout of the entire school just by using sound, and not only can he do that, but even though there are so many people in this school, he can he can ignore them all and find two people specifically, which is impressive, because it means he can distinguish between Kojo and Asagi and all the other people in the school. So that's impressive on Yaze's part. But uh, they end up going to the student council offices. Uh, they look up Nagubera and they find we see its design. It's like some like weird spire looking thing, which kind of reminds me of Nirvana from Fairy Tale, but uh, not really because Nirvana wasn't a spider. But um, we learn that Nir that uh, <laughs> not Nirvana that Nagubera is this inorganic life form and it's this biological weapon. And before we learn anything else, this teacher comes in, because he, he, I guess, he, I don't remember if the door was open or not, but he, maybe he heard something when the door was open, but he comes in at, trying to figure out if someone is in there. So Asagi forces Kojo underneath the desk, and they're hiding there. And, uh, <laughs> it's yet again another interesting position that, uh, that Kojo is in with Asagi, and his nose ends up starting to bleed, well, more, more so than it's bled before, actually. His nose really starts bleeding. Because not only is he in that position with Asagi, but he also sees that she's wearing these earrings that he bought her at some point in time. And she looks really cute, so he his nose starts to bleed. Luckily, his again, his vampire urges didn't go too far out of control. But um, so this is yet another thing that Sayaka ends up seeing, because she's spying on Kojo. She's mad about him following Himuragi, but she's following him, along with Himuragi following him, not the other way around. But you know, again, anime girl logic—they don't want to—they don't want to let facts get in the way of their conclusion. But um, Asagi and Kojo end up going up to the roof. They're talking. Um, Kojo mentions that there are these ancient texts, or describing how to use. Nagu Vera discovered recently and Asagi kind of gets quiet and she starts to think about something and that's what makes me think that the information that she decoded might not have been the location, the potential location of Nagu Vera, but actually how to use it but um we don't really know for sure right now she ends up going off and this is when Sayaka comes in and she she tries to kill Gojo 
they start fighting and arguing and stuff like this. And Sayaka mentions like how uh, Himiragi is her only friend and her being around Kojo just puts her in danger. Which, I mean, she's a sword shaman from the Lion King organization. Did she think that she wouldn't be in danger? No matter who she's observing, but whatever, whatever. Again, don't she doesn't want to let facts get in the way of her conclusion, but, you know, whatever. Um, she ends up actually managing to cut Kojo across the stomach. And whenever Kojo loses his blood like that, other from somewhere other than his nose, apparently, um, his powers start to... He loses control of his powers and his familiars. And Asagi comes in, comes back at this point. And she sees him starting to lose control of his powers, which is interesting. Because Asagi thinks that Kojo is a normal guy, but after seeing this, it's obvious that he can't be. So knowing that he's hiding something from her that Himuragi knows, um, it's, she'll probably assume that it, it has something to do with that. But um, that's pretty much how the episode ends. We see these soldiers or some someone, this group of soldiers, I guess. They're in this van, and they're driving towards the school, I think. And the guy who's driving, he has a picture of Asagi in the car. So that's interesting. So this guy knows Asagi or is related to her in some way. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the guy's her dad. But that seems like a cliche plot twist to bring in. But, um... Yeah, this these guys, at least the driver knows Asagi in some way. Maybe they work for the man-made island corporation, man-made island management corporation, or whatever they're called. Um, that's pretty much how the episode ends. In the preview, we see Himuragi showing up while Kojo is still losing control of his powers. And there's, there's this big blast of blue energy or something on the roof, so that's probably caused by Himuragi next episode. Um... We see, I guess they're in that van that the guy was driving, but Kojo and Sayaka are actually sitting next to each other in the back seat of some vehicle. So that's interesting to see them riding together and Sayaka not trying to kill him. But it looked like they were just talking, so that's interesting. Um, the next scene we see in the preview is... Um, I don't really know where they are. I'm going to assume it was the nurse's office, because there was this bed there, but... We see Himuragi, Asagi, Nagisa, and Astarte together. Astarte. So that's, you know, Himuragi and Asagi, okay. Himuragi and Nagisa, okay. The three of them together, that's kind of weird. But then you throw Astarte in, and it really makes you start to wonder what kind of situation they were in. But we see those soldiers showing up while those, uh, those four are in the nurse's office, I'm assuming. So... Next episode looks like it's going to be interesting, but as for this one, I I thought it was a great episode, to be honest. Information, the fights at the end, development between Asagi and Kojo. I, I thought it was a great episode. Just, it's the, the show, it's, it's, it, might, it might not be a kill not kill, or or an attack on Titan or something, but I still think the show is pretty good. I really do. I'm looking forward to seeing Vatler in action now because of this episode. Looking forward to seeing Sayaka in action because she has a sword, apparently. She was attacking Kojo with a sword. And we see her in the opening with arrows. We learn that she's she can use hexes. So these war dancers, I just want to see what the extent of what they can do. I want to see the extent of what Himuragi can do, because we've seen her with the, the spear thing, the spear lance thing, but well, we've also seen her use techniques like, uh, the I forgot what it was called, but the one she used on Eustache Rudolph, where she, after the uh, lance thing was broken and she kind of just like put her, put her hands on him and she kind of just got forced through the air into Kojo's punch, so now I'm, I'm interested in seeing the different kinds of powers all these guys have, I'm interested in just the whole plot between the Black Death Emperor faction, Nalaku Vera, what that's going to do. This this episode got us to look forward to a lot of things, revealed, revealed a lot of information, developed Vatler and Sayaka, plus gave some development to Asagi and Kojo. Got some action in there with 
Sayaka at the end, plus these soldiers. It's a lot. A lot happened. So I thought this episode was great, and I'm going to give it a nine out of ten. But um, that's it for this just under a thirty minute review. I, I honestly thought it was going to be more than thirty minutes, but I got through it a little more quickly than I thought I would. But uh, yeah, that's that's it for now. This episode of Strike the Blood gets a 9 out of 10. Rate, comment, subscribe. And I'll see you guys next time.